Hello and welcome. This is the introduction to chapter five. Chapter five is about energy and thermodynamics and chemical reactions. So energy is the ability to do work or to transfer heat. If you have energy to give, maybe you can put an object into motion. Maybe you can warm something up. If you need energy to put yourself into motion, maybe you need uh, a reaction to provide you with the heat or the ability to do work. Thermodynamics is a study of chemical changes, uh, excuse me, the study of energy changes that accompany chemical reactions. So say you have a reaction of, um, of A to B. The question is, how much energy perhaps does A have to absorb to form B? Or vice versa, how much energy is perhaps given off when A forms B? So you might think of the energy change of reaction as the energy of B minus the energy of A. Your delta is just your final minus your initial. And that some reactions will have to absorb energy in order for the reactions to occur, and others will have to um, undergo a process of giving energy off. So we can simply perhaps imagine two scenarios where A is up here and B is down here, and this is our energy. And in this case here, our delta E is going to be less than zero. Energy is given off if we form B in this example. But if B happens to be up here, then A is going to have to absorb energy in order to form B. In that example, our delta E will be greater than zero. And so reactions can occur in both of these you know, scenarios. It's possible for reactions to absorb energy from their surroundings for them to take place. It's also possible for uh, reactions to take place and give off that energy to their surroundings. Both reactions uh, are possible. It's possible for A to form a B that goes down or up in energy. It's perhaps gonna be a bit more likely that it's going to go down in energy, but it doesn't have to be the case. Some reactions can take place that need energy to be absorbed. So whether a reaction absorbs or releases heat does not actually allow us to predict necessarily if the reaction will or will not occur. If you want to discuss whether or not the reaction occurs spontaneously, that comes up in chapter um, 19 or 20. I'll just say 19 or 20. One of those two chapters discusses, I think it's 19, discusses the spontaneity of reactions. You might have learned about delta G and its relationship with delta H and minus T delta S. This is the main equation that if this is negative, the reaction can be spontaneous. If it's positive, then the reaction won't occur spontaneously. But that's not a discussion for this chapter. The discussion for this chapter is more along the lines of if a reaction occurs, can we determine if that reaction is releasing heat or absorbing heat, and then how can we understand how much and how that's related to um, the quantities of reactions that are taking place. So chapter five, study of thermodynamics, thermochemistry. We talk about the nature of chemical energy. We talk about the first law of thermodynamics in this chapter. We discuss enthalpies of uh, reaction in the middle part of the chapter. We discuss where you find some and determine some of these enthalpies of reaction experimentally using calorimetry. Calorimetry is just the study of the temperature changes that are accompanying chemical reactions. Um, Hess's law is how we might be able to put multiple reactions together. It's actually a very simple idea, and it really just follows the first law of thermodynamics. This is the one that says energy is conserved, neither created nor destroyed. So if you think about A goes to B, let's say that has a delta E of plus 10 kJs. Well, let's say B can then form C, and the delta E here is minus 20 kJs. So then if we have A go to C, so you imagine A goes to B, and then B goes to C, then delta E should be equal to minus 10 kJs. Kind of like adding these reactions up, B's canceling out, so I can just simply sum up 10 plus minus 20 to get minus 10 for A all the way to C. In terms of a picture, it might look like this. If A goes uphill by 10 to go from A to B, and then B goes down by 10, um, uh, well, it goes down by 20 to form C, and then the difference of A to C should be minus 10 kJs. There's a discussion of path-dependent versus independent quantities. Delta E is one of these like path-independent quantities. That means, like, let's say A forms something else like D, and that's form, let's say delta E there is plus 20. And then let's say D to C is equal to, no, has a 
um, a delta E of minus 30. And these numbers must, you now this must be minus 30 because A to C must still be minus 10 kJs. But it doesn't matter how we go from A to C, the delta E should be the same minus 10 kJs regardless of the path. So delta E is path independent. That's something that we'll talk a little bit about um, today, a little bit more later. Uh, but something that's path independent means it doesn't matter how we get from A to C. If we directly go from A to C, the delta E should still be minus 10 kJs. Now, where some values are not path dependent have to do with how heat and work kind of go together. Now, this is kind of confusing at first, but if you imagine, um, you know, doing a reaction where you're putting a car into motion, <clears throat> like burning octane. So if you're burning octane, you're getting energy out of that reaction. You're using some of that energy to heat up your engine. You're also using some, some of that energy to put your car into motion. The amount of motion that you can get your car to go into depends on how much octane you're burning. You, know, you can't put the car into more motion than the amount of gasoline that you're burning. Likewise, you can't heat the engine block up more than however much energy is coming off of that particular chemical reaction. Now, whether you heat the engine block up more or less, or you put the car into more or less motion, depends on how you use that reaction. So if you put your foot on the accelerator, you're gonna heat the block up less, but put the car into motion more. And if you put your foot in the uh, gas pedal, but you're in neutral, you're not moving anywhere, then you're really gonna heat your engine block up by a lot more. So if you start thinking of your delta E, which ends up being equal to Q plus W, we'll, we'll pick this notation up a little bit later, but it's like, think of a reaction as giving off energy, and that energy can be used to heat something up or put something into motion. The sum of those two, the sum of the heat that you have available to heat something up and the work that you can put some, some object into motion is given by the particular reaction. So the sum is still a state function. It's defined by however much energy the reaction is giving off. But you could have, in some cases, a lot of heat being generated if you're in neutral, not a lot of work being done. Or if you put the car into drive, then you could have maybe a lot of work being done and not as much heat. So the sum of the two are still kind of go hand in hand with each other based on however much of that reaction is taking place. Might be a little bit confused right now, but the whole idea here is that Q and W are not state functions. It depends on how we carry the reaction out in terms of how much heat or work we can perform with a given reaction. Now, you can only get so much heat or so much work, if you imagine making one of them zero, there's still a maximum amount of heat or work you can, you can get out of a particular reaction that def, you know, depends on this delta E, which is a state function. Remember, your state function means it's path independent. It doesn't matter how we carry the reaction out. It only gives off so much energy. This uh, Q and W, it depends on how we're carrying the reaction out. It depends if you're in drive or in neutral. So they're path independent, uh, uh, path dependent functions in the case of Q and W. So electrostatic potential energy is the uh, one way we can think of uh, energy of particles has to do with their charges. So if you imagine having two particles, let's say you have like charges, so you have two positively charged particles, they're going to repel. They're gonna repel and go upwards in energy. And if you were to separate the particles, then they sort of have like zero relative energy. So you start bringing the particles together and then they start increasing in their relative energy due to their repulsion if they have the same charge so the same thing happens if you bring two negative particles together, they repel each other. If you imagine bringing maybe two minus charged anions together, they're going to repel each other to a greater extent. So maybe this energy goes up higher um, and sooner for the, uh, the two minuses. And then the same thing, but opposite happens if these particles are opposite in charge. So if we have a negatively charged particle and a positively charged particle, then those particles can be attracted together and they go down in energy. So if you separate the particles, you go back to kind of having two independently uh, behaving particles that are at zero relative energy, and then you bring them closer together, then the energy starts dropping. So your energy of electrostatic attraction goes negative when the particles are opposite in charge, and it goes positive when they have the same charge. So you want your particles to be opposite in charge if you want them to be attracted together. And so then you can describe the electrostatic potential by sort of an equation here. Now, this equation is a bit more um, used in a uh, qualitative sense, that if you have a, a negative and a positive particle, 
that you're bringing together, then there's a beneficial attraction. So you get a sort of negative energy out here. And if you imagine making these both, say, now instead positively charged particles, then you're going to have an increase in your relative energy due to bringing those particles together. So you want them plus and minus if you want to get net attraction from the particles. And obviously the more highly charged, the better. So you can get a greater attraction between a two minus and a two plus than between say a minus and a plus charged particle. If you start thinking of maybe the attraction of sodium and chloride versus say um, calcium and uh, sulfide ion, you're gonna get a stronger attraction of the two plus and the two minus in the case of calcium sulfide. So the common unit here, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. We talked about this in chapter one, but that's just our fundamental um, unit of energy. Our SI unit of energy is one joule, and that relates back to the um, fundamental SI units of kilograms, meters, and seconds. So the first law of thermodynamics states that energy can be converted from one form to another, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. So what this kind of means is perhaps you can take kinetic energy and convert it into potential energy, maybe vice versa. Um, so you can imagine perhaps taking energy stored in chemical bonds, that's kind of the chemistry example. So maybe you take something like CH4 and then react it with oxygen to produce CO2 and water. I get two waters out. Physical states aren't so much what's important here. But you can imagine this reaction takes place with the flame. It's natural gas burning. We're going to need um, one, two O2s to give us enough oxygen on both sides. Uh, we mentioned before how you have to have enough O2. If you limit your O2 here, you can actually produce carbon monoxide. So just a reminder to change your furnaces if you have a natural gas or propane furnace at home. But if you have this reaction taking place, this reaction is giving off energy as it takes place. And it's giving off energy because we actually must have some energy stored within the bonds of CH4 and O2, and therefore we're making more stable bonds in the case of CO2 and water. So if you imagine um, the reactants being A, the products being B, this is the case where A is up on top, the products are down below, so we're giving energy off when this reaction takes place. Now the way you know that is this reaction takes place with the flame, like you're physically seeing the energy coming off this reaction when it occurs with the flame, um, and you can directly see with your own eyes the sort of uh, the, the energy being given off in this particular chemical reaction. So sunlight is then used to convert um, the, the energy of the sun with plants into chemical energy. So like we're producing things we can later burn with the sunlight and reacting with things like CO2. So if you imagine taking um, you know, CO2 together with water and sunlight, and then we can start producing things like sugars by photosynthesis. So if we take six CO2, six waters, combine them together, we can make our glucose plus our O2. Now this reaction here, we make six O2s, um, sort of produces the O2 that we can then later burn or use in our bodies, but then this reaction here is one where if we look at our A and our B, for our products and our reactants, the A is downhill. The sunlight has to be absorbed to give us the energy to convert our reactants into our products because it's a reaction that has an, uh, an energy uh, change, our delta E here, is greater than zero for that particular chemical reaction. So the reaction can spontaneously occur in the presence of sunlight within plants, but then CH4 can be spontaneously converted to CO2 in water in the presence of a flame that then continues to sort of feed itself as this reaction keeps that flame going. So the internal energy of a system is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energies of all the components in the system. Generally, this is something that's relatively hard to know in an absolute sense. So it's kind of hard sometimes to know the exact energy of your initial state. So a lot of times we try to calculate the change in energy between our initial and our final state. So sometimes a little bit easier to calculate a delta E for our final minus our initial and then characterize that some reactions go downhill in energy, then other reactions go uphill in energy. And both types of reactions can occur that just because a reaction has uh, a positive, um, in, or has an increase in delta E, doesn't necessarily mean the reaction cannot occur spontaneously. So some reactions 
um, lead to the absorption of heat from the surroundings. We call these processes endothermic. So some salts, when they dissolve in water, so um, some reactions being shown here of some barium hydroxide solution reacting with ammonium thiocyanate. Um, don't worry about the nomenclature, but they produce some products. And if you were feeling this beaker, you might wonder, okay, if it's endothermic reaction, the um, reaction is absorbing heat. So if this is our A and this is our B, then A is down here, B is up here. Your first thought might be it should feel hot because the reaction is increasing energy. But it turns out it's actually cold, that this reaction would drop in temperature. Notice the change in temperature goes from like 23 degrees down to, um, I can't see if that's minus, it goes down to minus 11 degrees C. Um, and it's dropping in temperature because the energy of the surroundings, like of the beaker, of the thermometer, everything touching this chemical reaction, the heat from those surroundings is being taken by the reactants to produce the products. So the, reacts, the, the reactants absorb the heat, and then the surroundings have lost the heat. So our Q of our reaction has, the reaction has absorbed heat. Think about the surroundings. The surroundings, if the reaction is absorbing the heat, the surroundings must be losing its heat. And so the surroundings drops in heat, drops in temperature. So an endothermic reaction will make the surroundings feel colder as it's taking place. Now there is um, a, a a key reaction that's endothermic, it's a phase change. If you imagine water liquid converting to water gas, the vaporization of water. Okay, so in order for water to boil or to vaporize, the water molecules are going to have to absorb energy. The delta E here is greater than zero. And this is going to be the case for every type of vaporization for every liquid substance going to its gaseous substance. Uh, because the liquid, you have to break the forces holding it together to turn it into a gas. And so now, if you think about this reaction occurring within your body, so say you sweat because you're hot, you're feeling hot, so your, your body, um, you start sweating, and then that sweat starts to evaporate. The evaporation is the liquid to the gas. Does that make you feel hotter or colder? The evaporation itself, like the reason why standing in front of a fan, if you're hot, will make you feel better, is because that's kind of forcing the evaporation the evaporation is taking your body's heat in order for the water to absorb the energy it takes to turn into a gas. And so it takes your heat away, makes you feel colder. So the evaporation makes you feel colder. So endothermic reaction, they won't all feel cold, but generally if you think about a reaction occurring like the vaporization of water in your skin, or if you have a reactant and some reaction taking place in a beaker that's endothermic, the reaction should start to feel colder than it originally was. So then think about the opposite. An exothermic reaction is one where heat is released by the system into the surroundings. So maybe you take a piece of potassium metal, throw it into water, and we start forming KOH and H2. The H2 actually starts to burn, so you see these flames evolving from this reaction. You can also think of like a combustion of um, you know, methane making CO2 and water occurring with a flame where you can usually kind of see this heat given off. If we were to feel this flask, you got this flame coming off, it should be too crazy to think that it should feel hot, that this is going to feel hot, or it's going to become warmer as the reaction takes place. Maybe this is 25 degrees C, and then it ends up warming up to 50 degrees C as the reaction is taking place. You get an increase in the temperature, but it's increasing in temperature because our reactants and our products here are dropping in energy, so the reaction's releasing energy. So delta E is less than zero. The reaction's losing energy, but the surroundings is gaining it. So again, the um, reaction's heat versus the surroundings, there's this negative relationship. So if the reaction's going to lose heat, then the surroundings is going to gain the heat that's being lost. So state functions, again, are the case where um, a state function is a path dependent, uh, um, excuse me, a state function is path independent. So like A on a map, B on a map are separated by say 100 miles. So how far away A is from B is a constant, it's not changing. Now, the direction you take to get from A to B, you might take a lot of different paths that lead you to spend a lot of different um, miles. Maybe it takes you one way 110 miles to get to B. 
Maybe some other way, you take more of a direct route and then it only takes you 102 miles. Maybe another time you take the direct route and it only takes you 100. It's like the path you take to get from A to B on a map is, you know, the miles you actually drive is dependent on the path. So that's not a state function. The state function is just how far away A and B are on the map. Now, it turns out that in terms of the thermodynamics that we saw earlier from like A to C, C to D, that no matter how we're going from A to B, B to the C, that the delta um, um, of A to, use a different symbol, because we're always going to C in the end. So we go A to D, D to C. No matter how we're going from A to C, that the difference between A and C is still the same. It's like the difference of 100 miles between A and B on a map. The difference in the stability of A and C is what determines the delta E here for this reaction. So no matter how we're carrying out this reaction, because it's always A to C in the end, that the difference of energy between A to C should come out exactly the same each time. So our delta E here should be the same as the delta E we get if we go from you know, the D and then from D to C. So A and B are still 100 miles away no matter how you travel to get there. So Q and W are kind of like the paths you take um, upon having some energy to use, perhaps from a chemical reaction, in terms of having some of that available for heat, some of it available for work. So let's think of this really simply. And in a way, like the, the signs of these things become relevant. We have to talk about the signs of Q and W. We'll do that later. But like, let's imagine you have 100 units of energy to give from your reaction. So let's say you have 100 kJs to use. You can use 100 kJs just to heat up an object or 100 kJs to put an object into motion. Or you could use 99 kJs for heat, 1 kJ for motion. Or you can use 95 kJs for heat and then 5 of the kJs to put an object into motion. The key is when you run a reaction, we have a reaction carried out, it gives off a certain amount of energy. And then the sum of the Q and W together remain as the state function, but the individual amount of heat or work you can use that energy given off from your reaction is dependent on how you're using that energy. This is like the accelerator example. We have the accelerator to floor in neutral, then it's all heat. If we're um, you know, in drive, driving down the highway, then we're having some combination of Q and W, but the sum of them together still add into whatever the delta E is for the reaction. So delta E for a reaction is equal to Q plus W. So it's kind of weird to see that this is a state function that the sum is a state function, but that the individual variables themselves are not state functions. So you can think of a battery, you can use the battery's energy to heat up a coil, to turn a fan on, there's only so much energy that a battery has, so you can only do so much of either, you can't do an infinite amount, you can only do as much as the energy the battery contains, so you can get mostly heat, you can get some sum of heat and work, because obviously the fan's gonna heat itself up, so you can't usually get 100% work. Um, so you can't just put objects into motion usually. Um, you have to probably heat up the objects as well. So enthalpy versus energy. Okay, they're almost synonymous with each other. In a class like this, they often are taken hand in hand. If you take an engineering class, they're not the same at all. Um, so like the enthalpy versus energy are very different whenever we have what you might call like a closed um, mechanical system. So whenever you have like a piston that's being driven, then the ideas of enthalpy and energy are very much different from each other, you know, but, but in this class here, we're talking about chemical systems. Chemical systems are basically either gonna be like, you know, open containers. So with an open container, you're not gonna be able to put that container into any kind of serious motion, or you just have some sort of closed container within these types of systems, energy and enthalpy are pretty synonymous with each other. Now, again, I'm not saying they're always synonymous with each other. If you have a closed mechanical system, then they're going to differ from each other by quite a bit. Okay, so if a reaction takes place at constant pressure, i.e. an open system, so if you have an open system, and the only work possible is pressure volume work, we can account for the heat flow in the process by measuring the enthalpy of the system. So the enthalpy of the system is going to just be equal to the heat change of that reaction occurring at constant pressure. Okay, so you might say that your delta H of reaction, like your delta E, is equal to whatever the heat change is for that reaction at constant pressure. And so the other way I like to write this is that the Q reaction 
is equal to the Q reaction. So the delta H is really telling you the heat of the reaction. In fact, a lot of times enthalpy is called the heat of reaction. So delta H is equal to the heat of the reaction when we have one of these open systems. And then if you have a closed system, it's approximately equal. It's not exactly the same. In some cases, it actually is exactly the same. But in some cases, it's just um, there's some small relation, or some small approximation. They're, they're not exactly the same, but they're very close to each other. So we can classify a process or a reaction as endothermic when delta H is positive. So kind of like when delta E was positive is the analogy here to the delta H being positive. So that's just the case where you have the enthalpy of your A versus your B being higher. So higher in energy, higher in enthalpy. Um, so heat must be absorbed by a reaction that has a positive delta H. So this is an A goes to B where delta H is greater than zero is classified as being endothermic then a process is exothermic whenever this a goes to b has a negative delta h so if delta h is less than zero then our our a is here our b is downhill relative to the enthalpy so again enthalpy and energy almost synonymous with each other for chemical systems so in this example here, negative delta H is how we classify an exothermic reaction. So the change in enthalpy, delta H, is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. So shown here is CH4 plus O2. If they are forming CO2 and water, then that reaction is going to give off minus 890 kJs per mole. If instead we have CO2 and two waters coming together to form CH4 and O2, so if our reactants are actually down here and we want to go uphill, then it's going to take us plus 890 kJs per mole to go uphill. So the first law of thermodynamics would say that if A to B, in this case CH4 and O2 going to CO2 and water, if that delta H is minus 890 kJs, then if we flip this reaction, have B goes to A, the first law of thermodynamics would say in order to have energy conserved, then the opposite must be opposite in sign, or plus 890 kJs. Now, whenever we have a delta H, notice that the unit of our delta H is just in units of energy. If we have a reaction of A to B minus 890 kJs, we're assuming a mole of A forms a mole of B. If we're being more explicit, let's write out the actual reaction that we have CH4, plus 2O2, physical states matter. Um, so we're forming CO2 gas plus 2H2O liquid. That this reaction as written, where the coefficients are moles, is what defines the delta H. So when we say delta H is minus 890 kJs, that assumes one mole of CH4 is reacting with one mole, or excuse me, two moles of O2 to form a mole of CO2 gas and two moles of liquid water. If you had gaseous water, then that reaction would have a different enthalpy associated with it. Okay, so the physical states matter. They're, they're those that are indicated within the reaction. So an enthalpy of reaction, so the delta H reaction is called the enthalpy of reaction.
You can imagine maybe H2 and O2 in a balloon producing water. We know this reaction gives energy off because we've seen this take place in class. There's a big explosion that takes place because the explosion is all that energy being given off, being given into the flame as that reaction is taking place. So a summary here. Um, this isn't maybe so much a summary of this video, uh, but just some reminders here. Delta H is, is an extensive property. What that means is if I have an A to B, delta H is say 10 kJs. If I double the coefficients and have 2A goes to 2B, now I have two moles of A converting to two moles of B, and the delta H should double. So delta H here would be plus 20 kJs. If I have 3A to 3B, it would be plus 30 kJs per mole. So the moles are understood, whenever I write the delta H of a reaction, the moles are understood to be whatever the coefficients are in the reaction. So plus 20 kJs per two moles of A, forming two moles of B, plus 10 kJs for one mole of A, forming one mole of B. The enthalpy change of a reaction is equal to the magnitude but opposite inside if you flip the reaction. So I have B to A using the above reaction, then the delta H would be minus 10 kJs. So flip a reaction, you flip the sign. The enthalpy change for a reaction depends on the states of the reactants and products. So if you change a physical state of water from a liquid to a gas, then that reaction with water as a product in the gas state would have a different enthalpy associated with it. So moving along here, the heat capacity and specific heat, the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of a substance by one Kelvin or one degree C is called the heat capacity. Now, the first thing I want to handle is that if we go from, say, 298 to 299 Kelvin, that that's a one degree increase in temperature. That would correspond to going from 25 to 26 degrees C. So if we go up by a Kelvin, it's the same increase in temperature as if we went up a degree C. So the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a substance by a Kelvin or one degree C is defined as the heat capacity. The specific heat capacity is the heat it takes to raise one gram of a substance by one Kelvin. So that's our specific heat. So some specific heats are shown for N2, um, for aluminum, notice it's aluminum as a gas, iron solid, mercury liquid, water liquid. We probably, well, we might know water is 4.1. It's actually 4.184 joules per gram kelvin i think that's useful because that's the exact conversion between a joule and a calorie because a calorie is defined precisely as the heat it takes to raise one temperature one gram of water by one degree c so one calorie is what it takes so one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules so that helps us understand this sort of exact conversion between the calorie and then the joule so where the calorie is just a non-SI unit of energy. But anyways, notice how water-specific heat is pretty high. Compare that to irons, it's actually relatively low. So if you had a pot of water on the stove, it takes it quite a while to heat up. If you have a heavy cast iron skillet, maybe it's about the same mass as a pot of water. So put a cast iron skillet on the stove and then put an equivalent mass, but in, the, in, in that case of water on the stove, and then heat them both up with the same burner and calculate how long it takes to heat them up. Obviously, it's going to take several minutes to heat the water up because the water has to absorb more heat in order to raise its temperature and then the iron um, doesn't have to absorb as much heat in order to increase its temperature so that cast iron skillet is red hot you know in just a few seconds okay and so that's the big difference there between their specific heats now where specific heat plays a role is if you can imagine the heat change a substance undergoes as it's changing its temperature then you can maybe say well what if we have a reaction taking place in water and we track water's temperature, then maybe we can figure out something about the reaction that took place in the water. That leads us to the topic of calorimetry. So calorimetry kind of deals with, you know, we can't know the exact enthalpy of our reactants and products, but what we can do relatively easily is monitor the temperature of, say, a water bath before and after a chemical reaction occurs in the cup. So maybe we'll set up a reaction in water, and we'll look at the temperature before, we'll have some reaction take place, and then track the temperature after. So we get our delta T so we can see how the temperature of the solution changes and relate that to whatever reaction took place in the cup. We'll talk more about the math behind this problem later.
So Hess's law is a fancy law. This is really just kind of like the first law of thermodynamics. But we could look at different reactions. Let's say we have reaction, the first one here, CH4 and O2 combining to form um, liquid water. We mentioned before that has a delta H of minus 890 kJs. Well, what then if we also know the liquid water to gaseous water has an enthalpy of reaction of plus 88 kJs when we have two moles of liquid water converting two moles of gaseous water? What I can do is I can take these two reactions and simply add them together. My water liquid is going to be present on both sides of the reaction and more or less cancel itself out. So I can therefore write CH4 plus 2O2 gas, CH4 is a gas, forms CO2 gas, plus H2O, two of them, now as a gas instead of a liquid. And so now my delta H is gonna be minus 802 kJs once I do the arithmetic of adding the reactions up, so then I add up the delta H's. Okay, and so you can look at this in the case of a diagram two over CO2 to a, our water liquid, and then the water liquid goes back uphill to form the water gas, so the delta H for this reaction isn't quite as negative as it was before. But the real lesson here is that whenever you can add reactions up and then cancel some of the products and reactants out accordingly and lead yourself to some new reaction, then you could calculate the delta H of that new reaction by simply summing up the reactions you used to yield that particular reaction. So and we were doing this earlier with our A to B and our B to C kind of demonstration that we were just showing you. There also kind of a description of Hess's law follows from the first law of thermodynamics as well. But the other side behind Hess's law is we could give you some reactions that maybe you have to manipulate to see how they add up. So that's really the catch with Hess's law is that maybe we'll give you two, three, or four reactions. You have to manipulate them so that they add up to some new reaction. Carefully, you might have to flip some of the reactions. You might have to double some coefficients, triple them, cut them in half. You might have to change those coefficients to lead up and add up to the desired reaction. So enthalpy is a formation are defined as the enthalpy change for the reaction in which a compound is made from its elements in their most stable elemental forms at room temperature. Okay, and so a very simple example would be um, like CO2 being formed from carbon in its elemental sample, that's solid graphite, and then O2 in its standard state, O2 gas. So what you're trying to do is make one mole of the compound from whatever its elements happen to be in their standard states at room temperature. And so we can do another example of say H2O. So water, we can pick any physical state. So the delta HF of water liquid would just be different from water gas. So water liquid, we could write its reaction would come from a half H2 gas because that's the elemental form of hydrogen and then O2 gas. So this is one of the rare reactions where it's actually okay to have fractions because we're always trying to make one mole of the substance. And so then the delta H of this reaction, whatever the delta H of this reaction is, divided by one mole, establishes the delta HF, the standard enthalpy of formation of the compound. So standard enthalpies of formation usually have units of kJs per mole. We can then use those with balanced reactions to figure out their enthalpies of reaction. Okay, so a very general example might be if you have, like, say, the reaction of propane gas with O2 to form CO2 gas and, let's say, 3H2O, um, let's say, liquid, that all you really need to do, and, well, we need to balance this, actually, appropriately. So it would be a 3 in front of the CO2, but only a 2 in front of the water, or excuse me, a 4 in front of the water, and then that's three plus two, that's five O2s. Okay, so what we need to do, if we could look up the delta HFs of CO2, water, and propane, we can actually use them to find the delta H of this reaction. So the delta H of a reaction can be calculated by summing up the standard enthalpy of formations of the products minus the reactants. That kind of makes sense. We're just doing the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants just in terms of their delta HFs. But one last caveat would be that what about O2? O2 is a gas, well that is the elemental form of oxygen, so the delta H F of O2 is actually equal to zero. Same thing with all other elements, but only in their most stable standard states at room temperature. Let's take a look at a table. So here's a table of a bunch of different substances, delta HFs, 
And so you could look up things like acetylene, ammonia, benzene on this chart. You can see all different kinds of examples. If you look in the back of your textbook, you'll find all different listed values as well. Notice a diamond form of carbon is a little bit higher in enthalpy than the graphite form, which would be zero, because that's the most stable form of uh, carbon. And so if you look in the back of your book, you can also look through different elements and see which standard state would be listed as zero. Now for most, like say metals, it's going to be the metal solid will have a delta HF of zero, but not the gas. Like if you have like sodium gas, um, that's not going to have a delta HF of zero because it's only the solid for sodium that has the standard enthalpy formation exactly of zero. So if you were to say some non-standard state for some element should not be equal to zero. Uh, mercury is the only metal that's a liquid. Bromine is the only other element that is a liquid that happens to be a non-metallic element. But whatever the physical state is, that's the most common state of that substance that it exists at at room temperature. So like for I iodine, it's I2 as a solid. For bromine, it's Br2 as a liquid. These all have delta HFs exactly of zero because they're standard enthalpy formation reaction would just be that substance producing itself, which of course would have to have a delta H of exactly zero. Now we can use Hess's law to find the delta H of this reaction. I'm not actually going to go through this mathematically other than to say you're going to take three times the delta HF of CO2 plus four times the delta HF of water, being careful to grab the liquid state, and then minus the one mole times, the, so, so these delta HFs are usually in units of kJs per mole, so you're using three moles times CO2, four moles times water, one mole times the delta HF of C3H8. Do this arithmetic, this is how you can calculate the delta H of this overall balanced reaction. Okay, and notice we can skip the O2 because the O2 is just equal to zero. So the delta HF here is just simply equal to zero. So bond enthalpy is the enthalpy associated with breaking one mole of a particular bond in a gaseous substance. So the first example, let's say we have a chlorine molecule and we're breaking a mole of the bonds, or let's say we have a mole of chlorine molecules, we're breaking all of those bonds to come up with separated chlorine atoms. So we have Cl2 going to two Cl atoms. The delta H here is equal to plus 242 kJs. Um, so it takes 242 kJs per mole to break that chlorine-chlorine bond. Um, in terms of the CH bond, it's about 415 kJs. So this delta H ends up being about 1660 kJs. So it's about 415 kJs per mole of CH bonds to break that particular bond. So the energy here, the enthalpy, it always takes energy to break bonds. So energy must be absorbed by the molecule to break its bonds. And if it's going to make new bonds, maybe those new bonds are stronger. Maybe they're weaker. We can use bond enthalpies to help us approximate delta H's of reaction. So the bond enthalpy is always positive because it takes energy to break bonds. Energy is always released when bonds form between gaseous fragments. So if we have um, atoms, like we have carbon plus hydrogens forming bonds together, that should always have a negative delta H. But then if we have a reaction taking place, we're, ma we're breaking some bonds, we're making some new bonds, it becomes a question of, are the bonds we've broken stronger or are the bonds we're making stronger in terms of helping us predict the overall delta H of the reaction. So the bond enthalpies can be used to approximate delta H. Um, the only thing I'll point out here is that it actually turns out being reactants minus products um, I think we'll point out more in class why that's the case. So we can predict a delta H here. We know we're only going to approximate it. We're not going to calculate it exactly as the sum of the bond strengths of the bonds broken in the reactants. So D is our symbol for bond strengths. So it would be the bond strengths of our broken bonds. So we're summing all of those up minus the sum. Um, I don't know why I'm wearing delta. It should be the big summation sign. Uh, it should be the summation sign of all the broken bonds in the reactants minus the sum of all of the form bonds in the products. So the only thing I'll tell you right now is weird is that it's the reactants minus the products here, but that'll make sense when we start thinking of Hess's law because we're going to calculate the energy it takes to break the bonds, 
to be a positive number. And then the energy we get back when we make the new bonds. So we subtract that energy. So that takes us through chapter five. So the nature of chemical energy, um, that um, ions attract each other if they're opposite in charge, that bonds uh, require energy to break and give energy back when they're made. Um, the first law of thermodynamics helps us understand A goes to B versus B goes to A. That the delta H or the delta E would just flip if we flip the reaction. Helps us understand how we might manipulate the coefficients and how that might change delta E or delta H. Uh, we can understand enthalpies of reaction, where we get them from, perhaps through calorimetry, and then look at Hess's law for rearranging reactions, coming up with even newer reactions uh, enthalpies, and then summarizing and using enthalpies of formation, bond enthalpies. Maybe we'll get into a little discussion of foods and fuels as we get through the chapter.